the, when it comes out that coil, uh, the mass spectrometer, what it does is it causes the uh, uh, molecules to bust apart and then go on to a uh, plate. Now when it hits this plate, it's reading the charges and the atoms that are on there. So say if it takes a complex molecule, say like THC, bust the THC molecule apart, the molecule slams up against this plate and it reads exactly what atoms are hitting on this plate and it will create a list of potential chemicals that it could be. Um, but with that, if it has, you know, say 10 carbons, 15 hydrogens, 3 nitrogens, and a couple sulfurs, there's hundreds of different possible compounds for that. That's the reason why the uh, gas chromatography works with the mass spectrophotometry because the correlation of when it came out, how react, uh, showing how reactive it was to the coils and what time it got eluded through the entire coil system and matched with the system of knowing exactly what molecules it is, when you put those two together, it creates a very, very definitive idea of what chemical it could potentially be. Um, this is considered the gold standard. This right here, uh, many tests like say like the ELISA can read up to like at the best I've seen I think is like 50 uh, micrograms per deciliter. The GCMS I know can get down to at least five and it will give a de very definitive number too. Um, let's see what's next. All right, now sample types. Obviously most of these you aren't going to be dealing with, uh, well some of these you aren't going to be dealing with. Here's one people really, really get curious about. Um, hair as a standard is not tested past nine months as a standard. Um, I've talked to a few companies and you can get it done past the nine months but you have to give two samples so they'll do a nine month and a full hair sample. Uh, but for the most part they don't do that. And the way they work with the hair is they take the hair sample and they'll dissolve the hair and with this dissolved hair sample they'll take out the uh, liquid end of it and then run it kind of like they do with the ELISA and EIA and then if there's a positive they'll go with a GCMS confirmatory testing. Um, the other important thing about hair is it's deposits of the metabolites that are in there. So say you're in a party, you're, uh, a bunch of people are smoking some pot and um, you end up getting a hair sample. If you don't smoke, it will not affect you. Even if you were there that night before, you didn't shower, you go in, you're worried that the pot's still in your hair, it won't matter because your body's going to break down the THC molecule to meta different metabolites and that's what actually is getting deposited in the hair and that's actually what's being uh, tested for and not the actual THC itself. Um, urine sample, this is the you know, gold standard amongst most people. Uh, many people here I'm assuming has had to deal with having to take a piss test. They're not fun depending upon you know, the circumstances. Um, <laughs> now the important thing, actually I'll go ahead and get on the, how they test for adulteration on the uh, urines later on. Um, blood is one of the unique ones because it doesn't always test for the metabolites. Like I said with the hair and the urine, they're going to be testing with metabolites instead of testing for the actual chemical itself. Um, but with blood, they're actually able to test for the very specific uh, drug itself if they want to to know if you were actively on it at that point in time. They can also test for metabolites if they so choose. Um, now would you get your blood tested, do you normally the two that you'll be seeing them put the uh, sample into is going to be a gray top tube. Uh, there's two different chemicals in there. One of them is it's an anticoagulant simply to, just to make it so it won't clot up. Um, the other chemical in there is an anti-metabolite. And the anti-metabolite is going to stop any of the uh, red cells, white cells, etc., from metabolizing anything that's going to be in there, be it glucose or heroin. Um, now, I put stool in here because I had a uh, personal friend asking me if there's a way to, you know, fish out someone's septic tank to see if they've been smoking pot. You know, I don't know why they would want to do that. Um, <laughs> but with the stool, technically there's no stool testing. Um, there's a very, very, very defined um, exception to that rule which is called a meconium test. Uh, for people in the medical industry, who aren't in the medical industry rather, uh, a meconium test is a, the first stool sample of an infant. 
Um, I think the reason why these are the only stool samples that are done, now I haven't had this part confirmed, is that an infant's stool is not contaminated by bacteria yet. Um, I mean, people's uh, you, uh, you know, bowel system is completely just flooded with bacteria, which can change, manipulate all these different drugs, whereas an infant's stool sample isn't going to have that effect. And it brings in a very also major point of a lot of your release of these chemicals, of these metabolites, is actually in your stool, but this gets further broken down in ways your body can't even break it down. Um, also, meconiums are very, very legally binding. Um, I see, I would say, four a month most likely from our OB area from girls who would come in, have a child, she tested positive for whatever drug, they'll test the baby to see if the baby uh, was contaminated by the, um, by the drugs. Um, obviously, I've already talked about breath enough, you know, not too big of an issue on that one. Um, that's really just gonna be alcohol testing. Um, now the last one is body fluids and tissues. This is a wide scope right here because it's not very often done. Uh, the most common one would probably be salivary testing. Uh, salivary testing is going to be using the EIA uh, for the most part. It's not really too big. Um, you have the potential of doing sweat testing where they put a patch on you. You have to wear it for so many hours. You take it off. Mm, excuse me. And then they'll take the sweat and try and test it. It's not very common. I didn't really hear about it until I did some specific research just to make sure it wasn't there and it ended up being there. Um, other kind of body fluids is the viscous fluids that is in the eye. A lot of times people will take that and use that to see if the person was under drugs when they were dead or when they died. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then also you could potentially, if you really, really wanted to, use certain kind of body tissues for testing. Uh, the big one would be adipose tissue, you know, fat tissue, uh, for testing with uh, mostly THC or any other kind of fat soluble uh, drug. But you know, THC being the big one on that end. Um, now right here I just have a kind of a, a couple lists of some very, uh, of drugs, of where they kind of stand on drug testing. Um, commonly tested drugs, amphetamines, TCAs, which are antidepressants, oxycodone, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, psilocybin, and cytophytamin. Um, the bottom two, just you know, basic painkillers, your ibuprofen, your Tylenol, things of that nature. Amphetamines can range anywhere from methamphetamines, like say ecstasy or ice, to simple stuff like say Ritalin or even your diet pills are going to be less leveled as amphetamines. Um, and that's the reason why things like the GCMS come in so importantly, is a G. GCMS will, won't say it's an amphetamine, GCMS will say it's the specific amphetamine and that way they know that you're, you know, you just can't say, oh, I took a diet pill, they'll know that you, you're on crank. Um, <laughs> and then barbiturates, benzodiazepines, and oxycodones, um, that's mostly is going to be commonly tested for just for uh, therapeutic monitoring. Making sure you're taking your drugs and not someone else. Make sure you're not taking too much of your drugs. Um, there is a lot of money that ends up going into a uh, pain management with the oxycodone. A lot of money that goes into that. Uh, now, commonly tested drugs that are illicit, uh, cocaine, methamphetamines, um, ecstasy, if you did not know, is actually in methamphetamine. The MA is you know, methamphetamine. Um, opiates, PCP, THC. I honestly don't know why PCP is commonly tested for. You don't see it a lot uh, on drug tests uh, showing up positive. Um, but it is commonly tested for. I really haven't figured that one out just as a... Uh, conceptual idea. Um, opiates are very, very heavily tested for. I really wasn't sure where to put this as com uh, illicit or, il uh, or illicit, but um, you're looking at a lot of things like, say, morphine and heroin, um, I mean, and ranging from those to just the simple ones that they use as a minor, minor uh, anesthetic while you're, at the, like, say, at a hospital or something. Um, also, important piece of information is certain things like heroin. Uh, when they test for that, your body metabolizes opiates in a very strange way. 
And um, like heroin is actually going to end up getting broken down into morphine and then morphine broken down into something else and then that's something else broken down into something else and there's a long chain. So when you get tested for heroin, it actually may end up showing that you were taking morphine instead or something other uh, or something else down the chain. So they know there was a chance you had one of these opiates, but your, meta- but your body metabolizes these so quickly that they really can't determine unless they get a very, very quick sample on you. Now for uncommonly tested drugs. Um, Very, very um, big urban legend is that LSD cannot, cannot be tested in your urine. That is false. Most places do not test for it in your urine. Um, for many reasons. It is not considered a dangerous drug because it's not something you see people, you know, you don't have the crack core equivalent of an LSD head. Um, (laughs) And also LSD comes out of your system so quickly that there's only a very narrow window of time to be able to actually test for it. Uh, I'll get Q&A a a little bit later. Um, (laughs) um, But I I have confirmed that there are hospitals, at least in my region, that do have an LSD on their standard panel. Uh, My hospital and most others don't have it, um, but it is there. Um, Psilocybin, like uh, uh, psychedelic mushrooms, um, that is also not commonly tested for for the same reasons. Uh, It's not considered a quote-unquote dangerous drug. It's out of your system very quickly. Um, And the other thing about it, too, is that there's no actual metabolites uh, that's actually produced from psilocybin, at least not for the most part. Uh, the drug was discovered be in one of the major ways of shamans in North, uh, upper North America back in the uh, long before the settlers would feed a poisonous mushroom to a horse, collect the urine from the horse, drink the urine, and the horse's body would break down all the poisonous uh, chemicals in the mushroom, but leave the psilocybin untouched, so they're able to drink the urine and have a spiritual journey from drinking horse piss. Um, we call that beer nowadays. Um, <laughs> DMT. <laughs> uh, DMT. Uh, that is a very uncommonly known drug, but a very potent one. It was actually one of the drugs that was listed as a uh, Schedule One when, in the 19, was it 1970, I think, when that a uh, law came, pa- uh, when the scheduling all happened. Uh, DMT was actually one of those main ones. Again, it's another, actually the next three, uh, DMT, mescaline, and peyote, all of these um, are psychoactive drugs. They are not considered the dangerous ones. Uh, they are out of your system a lot quicker. It's harder to test for them. They're not fat soluble, so they're not going to stay in your uh, fat cells and be released slowly over time. Um, and the noxious oxide is also on the same concept. Not that it's you know not dangerous or anything, but it's just it's out of your system so quick that these drugs right here are just really hard to test for because of the time frame that the people are allowed to be able to test for it. Um, it's not reasonable and financially feasible to do it because they're you know, not dangerous and they have to catch you so quick it's you know, not reasonable to them. Um, now for a fun part. Um, adulteration. This is uh, primarily for uh, urine drug testing. Um, obviously, an observed is they're going to watch you pee to make sure it you know, leaves your penis, goes into the cup. They know you didn't you know, use someone else's sample, things of that nature. Those are not fun. Uh, guys get really pissed off when you have to do that. Uh, now, specific gravity, for those who don't really know what that is, um, the specific gravity of water is 1.00000. You know, continuing on, um, but water is almost never pure, so water always have a specific gravity that's a little bit higher. Like it would be, you know, one point zero 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 four. It would actually be considered like pure water. Um, but when you get into urine testing, the specific gravity of urine range, normal range is. 1.01 to 1.025 is a standard of what your urine specific gravity should be with all the other uh, factors in there. Uh, different proteins, creatinine, um, urea, and uh, even epithelial.